Okay, so thank you everyone for uh, coming back for our second second morning, and we're delighted to have uh, this morning a discussion between uh, two uh, FCC commissioners. We're very honored to have uh, Commissioner Mignon Clyburn here with us and Commissioner uh, Michael O'Reilly. Uh, both have been introduced earlier, so I, I won't waste your time. Uh, and, 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 uh, but they're, they're, the uh, discussion will be moderated by Brian Fung, who is uh, a reporter at the Washington Post, where he reports on uh, technology and tech policy. So I am going to just get out of the way and uh, let them have this uh, conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, so uh, let's just jump right into it. Okay. Um, you know, I wanted to start with a bit of a thought experiment. We've been talking a lot about um, you know how communications technologies change so quickly and so much. Um, you know, whether you're talking about over-the-top uh, video or um, high-speed fiber. Uh, so you know, I, I guess you know. We spent a lot of time talking about those, but also about how to protect um, and, and manage legacy systems. And I, I guess the question for you to start is, you know, if you could, you know, looking at how the, the competitive landscape looks like right now, uh, if you could redesign the FCC from the ground up, what would that look like? What would your, your priorities be? Um, you know, how would you allocate resources? What, you know, what would you um, want to, uh, you know, what kind of interest would you be hoping to promote? And maybe uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, I'll, I'll start with well, you. I, I, please, I, please, Commissioner. You Michael. know, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm from the South, so we always say good morning. And thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> and thank you for the opportunity uh, to spend uh, my second uh, full day also um, in Aspen. Uh, so I'm going to redesign because it's what I do. Um, kind of take a liberal interpretation, <laughs> not because I'm a liberal um, necessarily. Uh, with, to your question, because I think part of the benefits that we are realizing right now is because of legacy regulation and platform. We're learning platforms, we're learning. So I would not be an advocate of redesigning. I am always an advocate of being nimble and forward thinking when it comes to policies um, and the things that we've learned in, in this space. Uh, so when you hear me speak and take positions, you know, particularly with the, um, you know, with the, the notices. You, you talk about over the top and um, and our, um, you know, quest to um, seek whether or not things should be MVPDs should be redefined and the like. Um, looking at the um, landscape um, ever changing, um, I think it's important for us to uh, to always keep in mind those four pillars that we speak about in the Communications Act and how it's applicable uh, to these spaces. Um, we want competition. We want um, you know, choice. Uh, we want consumer protections. We want all of those things. And how do we achieve that in the different, uh, uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, in the different media or telecommunications platforms? I think that's the most important um, foundation for me. So um, I am an advocate of um, having a diversity um, of voices. I am an advocate of uh, diversity in terms of choices. Uh, and so that's what you see me doing based, again, on the experiences and the things that we've learned, uh, respecting legacy platforms, but knowing uh, that all of these things need to be complementary uh, as we approach um, a regulatory, um, you know, our, our regulatory posturing. So to you, the FCC is mainly an agency that um, is trying to promote choice for, for people. And we learn from um, both from our, uh, the things that we've done right and those things that we have misstepped. And I think that's why I, I'm not necessarily a proponent of, 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 of you know, st starting over, but again, you know, learning and, and grasping and growing from those experiences. Commissioner O'Reilly, what is the FCC for? <laughs> so I should start, thank you for having me and please continue to, to eat. But um, I, I think I would start by saying, I, I'm not one of those people, and there is a debate that has been long-standing that we should get rid of the FCC. So I, I do think there's still value in having an FCC. Your question is, how should it be? You know, what would it look like uh, going forward? In my perfect envision, and, and I don't know that I would want to go through every component, but I would. Video is a, a very good place to start. I would spend considerable amount of time removing legacy regulations. If you saw the dinner last night from what Google's able to do on YouTube, what a number of the over-the-top providers are able to do today, all of that's being done without the FCC. And then you think about the regulations that we put on current providers and the burdens that, that come from consumers, that cost is going to consumers in one form or another. So I would remove a number of those barriers rather than, and I've articulated this, you know, we're gonna have an item later this year, I have 
very little interest in, in capturing those companies that are trying to provide over the top into <coughs> Title VI. I, if I were still in Congress working for members, I would be very interested in, in spending time on Title VI because I think it's outdated and has a lot of work to catch up to our modern uh, video marketplace. So um, just to touch on another agency that's been in the news lately, the Federal Trade Commission recently released a set of guidelines sort of um, defining more clearly what it means by competition. Um, are there you know, certain authorities at the FCC uh, that you think would benefit from a similar kind of clarification? I mean, we talk a lot about you know, um, uh, you know, getting Congress to update you know, just what the FCC's authorities are, but are there things that the FCC could do itself to clarify some, uh, some of its, uh, you know, what, what, if any, would be sort of vaguer authorities at the FCC? I mean, we have a, a number of things teed up. Um, to do just that. Uh, we are always reinventing ourselves and I think that's a positive. Um, and I take slight, uh, uh, I don't want to say issue, but um, exception so early to what issue. you, well, you know, um, to what you say, you know, because yes, um, you know, we talked about and we see the, the magic of YouTube and, and other similarly situated, um, you know, evolutionary technologies. And I think um, that is in part because of um, our regulatory, our continually, um, you know, regulatory, uh, our ability to reinvent ourselves. Um, and I think it's in part because of the FCC's willingness to uh, be forward thinking. Um, and we don't live in vacuums. Um, and so, um, you know, one a pebble, an FCC pebble in the water has a, a, a ripple effect going forward. So I think all of these things are influence. Uh, complementary, sometimes they um, uh, 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 kind of rub against uh, the norm, and I think all of those things are positive. Um, we are doing that, and uh, again, various decisions that you will um, uh, uh, you will hear about over the course of the next few months, and we will continue to do so. Uh, um, I, 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 I still don't think that the providers that are providing over the top today have have benefited from the FCC. They've benefited from not having the FCC. Uh, and that's that's the a wonderful thing. I don't. I also don't know that. And I maybe I might disagree that we are a forward-looking agency. I'd like to believe we were, or that hope we were, but I don't believe we are at the current structure, uh, and the current current decisions we make. But um, so I, I'm a little troubled on that side. Um, I may may disagree, but we're that's very fine. good friends. That's fine. Yeah. You know, provide a, Most a lively <laughs> provide a, a lively discussion. Um, so I just think that there's a great deal of things that the commission can do to provide more clarity in a number of different areas. The difficulty is that every time that we provide, you know, take net neutrality for for example, and I don't want to spend our, we spent a great deal of time on that issue yesterday, but we opened up great uh, swaths of area and just said, you know, this is called a catch-all. Go do what you want. That's not any clarity for for industry to try and figure out how they're supposed to operate going forward. Um, so every time that we try to provide some clarity, we seem to, at the same time, open up uh, just unknowns that, and, and, and companies have no idea how, how to operate within our structure. We talked about yesterday about the, the enforcement guidelines and how I personally believe they're going to be useless or harmful going forward. No one knows what that process is going to be. Uh, it is whatever the, the, the agency, the, the bureau feels at that given moment. And that's not, not the clarity that, that companies need to be able to offer services in our current environment. So one of the things that um, I see in anything we do, particularly in a regulatory space, is you have a quest for clarity and perfection. And getting there oftentimes is, is bumpy and uncomfortable. Um, but not allowing, if you go, if you travel around the world, you will see different regulatory frameworks that do not allow for the engagement in which we do. And so democracy, um, uh, you know, a robust engagement, uh, you know, notices and, and, and uh, further notices, all of those things are, can be regulatively um, uncomfortable, <laughs> you, know, uh, you, know, regulative, you know, relatively um, uh, messy. I'll just go on record, <laughs> and you can quote me on that. Um, but it's a framework which is inclusive, and that in and of itself to me is worth all of the imperfections uh, that we speak about. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't lock uh, you know, every uh, uh, incumbents or new entrants into a certain paradigm. I think in and of itself um, you know, that is a price worth paying for any type of discomfort or bumps along the road that, uh, that we may um, you know, be realizing. So I take what you, what you say in terms of um, you, you know, our, uh, I think uh, our quest 
for continual information flow and, and um, I believe the capacity to keep learning and doing better. Um, it, again, it's gonna be imper imperfect. Um, and we'll just keep working towards a perfect until we get it as close to right as possible. I don't want to get it 100% right because I think that that would lead to stagnation, you know, being stagnant. Um, so a little friction, a continual friction, I think is a positive. And, and most of you in this room um, are here as a result of a little friction and a less, less stagnation. Well, I don't think we have to worry about ever getting close to perfect at the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think Point we, taken. I think we got plenty of room to provide as much friction <laughs> And we have provided a lot of opportunity for people in Washington to make a lot of money. So that's, Absolutely. God bless this. And so, I'm, I'm for making money. So <laughs> switching gears from friction to cooperation, uh, something that you both have worked on is um, giving rate of return carriers the ability to collect universal service funds for standalone broadband. Are, are we still on track for a mechanism for that by the end of the year? Or I'll can you give an update? Years, well, I, yeah, yes, I, mean, I have, my colleagues and I are, are trying to uh, provide a mechanism that would, they would uh, address the issue of standalone broadband for rate of return carriers. We would like to do that by the end of the year, depending on, but it's more important to get it right. We're trying to do that in a collaborative way, working with all interested parties, not in a trying to force the answer on any, any particular uh, company or, 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 or association. We're trying to figure out the best way that we can do that with sound principles behind it. But I, I've approached this too, saying this is an important task but my real concern is, is this, you know, most of these providers are offering these services. The question is, should they get subsidies? And, and that's, that, that's something we'd like to answer. But I, I, until we can answer these questions, we can't deal with other issues because that's front and center. And the, the, the areas, that, the, the concerns that I have most in universal service are those areas in America that have no service today or just dial up or something really poor. And I've traveled around the country and seen and, and talked to people about how bad their service is and trying to figure out how can we get, and we can't address that until we can solve this issue. So it is a very important issue, and I think we're doing a good job in working with my colleagues. We have similar thoughts on this, and so we're doing the hard work that's needed to try and find a solution, but I really want to solve it and move on to the, to the bigger, more difficult questions going forward. And, and this is, uh, I, I want to give credit where credit's due. You often hear and, and see us disagree on some um, key issues. On this one, um, we're working collaboratively. When we're looking at um, rate of, you know, the rate of return uh, carries, when we're looking at um, you know, making the Universal Service Fund as a whole uh, you, you know, more efficient, uh, getting rid of, rid of um, any waste, fraud, and abuse that exists. One of the things that was striking to me um, uh, you know, leading up, when you look at where subsidies are going, and as my colleague um, said, not going, subsidies for years were going to um, maintain uh, support for Disney World. Disney World. A lot of need for subsidies there, right? Um, and so we need to really look at our framework and recalibrate it so that the monies are flowing where needed. Um, that um, we're haircuts <laughs> and, and, and other clips uh, that need to be made are made um, because this fund was set up to bridge communications gaps, not to maintain either gold-plated or platinum-plated systems. I, yeah, I'm just going to put it out there. Okay. And so um, this is what we are, we are uh, working. Um, this is where... Um, I might have a little harder edge than uh, <laughs> uh, my colleague, I, and I, I, will, uh, I will be the first to, to say that sometimes I go a little further um, than he would in terms of verbally speaking about. But I'm very passionate about, yeah. um, because when I go home to South Carolina, um, the common refrain, particularly in rural areas, is we need broadband in order to thrive. The money is not flowing there, but the money's flowing in Disney World. I've got a problem with that, with that. I really do. So let's talk now about uh, another program, Lifeline. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, Commissioner O'Reilly has floated a cap on Lifeline um, spending at current rates. I think uh, the figure is 1.6 billion. Um, but Commissioner uh, Clyburn, you know, you've you've said before that what you'd really like to see is, uh, you know, you've described it as disciplining program expenditures. And so the question, I guess, to you is, you know, how, how much. Uh, how much in savings are there before you have to start thinking about um, disciplining with a, with a cap? Well, what has not been said enough in this space is how much money we've saved 
since the reforms in 2012. We saved about $2.75 billion in Lifeline alone because of the reforms already in place. I don't see any um, exposés ab about that. Um, but this is one of those areas where I think we have maybe the same overarching goal, but different um, ways of, of getting there. So you're gonna see a little, little bit of debate. If you came here for that, you're gonna see a little bit in a second. <laughs> um, and, and so um, I was not a proponent of um, you know, setting a, a, a cap um, at, at this point um, in time in a program because the cap that was proposed, you mentioned the $1.6 billion. This is a 30 year pro old program. And to establish a cap um, that just looks at one year or one snapshot in time, that would in essence foreclose the opportunities for 60% of those eligible was not something that I was willing to sign up for. What I, was sign what I did sign up for is us asking the questions of what it should be. Um, so uh, this is a program um, that has been stuck in a 30 year time warp. It has not been modernized uh, for the information age. Um, I am passionate about what tools do we have in our arsenal to close the digital and communications divide. I think a, a recalibrated, rebooted um, uh, program and I always, I jokingly say, uh, the program formerly known, uh, soon to be formerly known as Lifeline, because I think we should sunset the current program and, um, and, and re-establish what I propose to call iBridge Now, which would be just what it sounds like, an information technology-driven bridge to the future, which would uh, allow and which will enable those who are temporarily down on the, economically down on their luck, to have an opportunity to have um, a, a, a monetary uh, assistance to help them uh, bridge their uh, communications um, challenges. I don't know if you saw a program last, the news last night where there was this lady that would have brought you to tears that just picked up a computer for her 16 year old, a refurbished computer, and she said, I couldn't have afforded it. I couldn't, I cannot convey to you um, how much how moving uh, that exchange was with that reporter. She could not afford to provide her 16-year-old with the information, with, with the current tools needed. Um, there are millions in this country who do not have the ability to connect. And I think a, a rebooted uh, you know, program that will allow all of those eligible uh, to sign on um, is one in which I would endorse. Well, I, I would say that I don't think there's we have a lot of commonality in this 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 issue. I, I had, you know, all of universal services, and it, it starts from a point when I when I came in that is already you know down the tracks, and so it's not something I would have designed exactly how we are, but we are where we are, and so I would have preferred, and I appreciate the, the commissioner's comments in terms of uh, rebooting. Uh, I, I was. I would have preferred we fix a number of the things on fr uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. The commissioner talks about savings um, that we've been able to generate, but that just shows you how out of whack we were, right? If you can produce, you know, if, if your, your savings to, or your reductions in, in spending is 2.75 billion, it tells you how out of, uh, out of bounds you were. So that, that's a good work to be done to try and bring it back to reality, and that, that, that I'm supportive of, but um, we've got more work to do on that space. So I am, for a, a, a lifeline program or whatever we want to call it. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm for- I appreciate your support for iBridge now. I, I, I said to you, I think in a different form, I'm willing to trade that for a cap if you want. <laughs> uh, if you, the if, right cap, we'll talk. Well, and, and I, I originally started with it. I thought, I, I think a cap is important. Um, I also was willing to, to be flexible and I went to uh, what I was calling a hard budget because we have a budget on every other portion of universal service. So this is the one piece that doesn't have a budget and I, I, I would have done a cap but that was something. So hopefully we can find common ground and, and I'm open to what that number is. I started with a place but we can figure out how best to, 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 to get to home because um, it's something I, I generally would like to see us uh, find a 5-0 scenario but um, there are some things that, that we have to do uh, to, to improve this program going forward. 
um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. And to put another uh, point on this, I am for continual reforms of this um, uh, program. I put uh, forth a five-step um, I think a blueprint uh, to do this. I just happen to be of the mind that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that we can improve and uh, provision, um, you know, a pathway of provisioning services. Uh, people cannot wait for connectivity. That 16 year old, if she had to wait, would have graduated without the tools she needed. I don't want another person um, similarly situated if this will make a difference for them to be connected, uh, to be without. Um, so um, again, our timelines may be a bit different. Our goals are, are relatively in sync, and we'll duke it out. Well, no, I, <laughs> it gives your head, you know, a very good plan, and 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 I, thinking thinking it through in terms of how I was going to approach this. You know, she, she had five points, and I'm like, well, I've got to be better than that. I'm going to put ten points forward. So I put ten points forward, and one of them is the, he the, was the, jealous. Yeah, one of the one of that is the the, the cap, and so I. I your, your point is, is, is valid. We want those people who absolutely need it to be able to, um, to benefit from it. But then I also want those people who do not need the program to not benefit from that. And I think that's where we've got a good deal of work to do. So we're in sync with that in terms of the entire universal service a portfolio, as you could tell, um, where it is not needed, the money should not flow, um, where there is um, not eligibility, the, um, the benefits uh, should not flow. So we're in sync with that. But so I, I wanted to press you a little bit when, um, you know, Commissioner Clyburn, you just said you're in favor of a right cap, or you would consider or a, a budget. right cap. You know, I, I, sure. you know, I, I follow, you know, because I like him today, so I use the word cap. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, I, but can, you know, I, I'm a, a, from a budgetary framework. Mm -hmm. I, I, but but please, could you I mean, sort of be more specific about that? I mean, like, what, what's you know, I understand you can't float out a, a hard number, or you may not want so to. So one but, of the things that I made um, mentioned that this uh, right now. We're at a little less than 40% of those mm -hmm. who are eligible taking part of the program. Um, and, and so any type of budget framework should have a realistic, um, uh, you know, should take into account um, you know, as, as close to 100% as possible, I, I believe. Um, but if it's not used, it's not spent. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I, I was in favor of asking questions about a budget or a cap, um, but, but this is one of those programs, if you don't sign up, the money does not flow. Uh, but I did not want to and would not endorse anything that would foreclose opportunities. That is my point. Um, if, if it's properly marketed, properly designed, um, is a dignified program that, um, and one of the, the main things that, um, uh, that uh, one of my five um, uh, appoints uh, uh, reinforce, and this is not negotiable for me, the carriers can no longer or will no longer be the ones who certify uh, the, uh, those who are eligible. That to me is at the heart, um, optically is at the heart of the problem. If we get rid of that, then any type of uh, incentives for th that level of efficiency or in some cases, um, you know, outright fraud. I'll just, you know, put it out there. Uh, that would be gone, and we can really, um, you know, work on, you know, having a program that will uh, be targeted on, and deliver uh, the uh, the opportunities needed for those without. So I, I just com comment on that, and I agree with a, a lot of that. Um, I, I I would say that it, I'm not committed to a number that that is is such a, such a scope of if it if at 40 percent we're spending 1.6 and uh, what, what's, it, what's the total to get 100 to be about 4 billion? Um, that 4 billion has to come, that, that's more than doubling the program. That has to come from all of the consumers in America today. And so the woman who could, couldn't afford a computer, we're going to take more from her, you know, in her, in her, in her phone rates and in her services so we can pay for, for the other programs. And that's, that's problem for me is that I, I worry about the, 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 those folks who are in middle, uh, middle income and lower middle income and what the burdens we already place on them. You're, we're already imposing a fee of 17.1%, I think is the current number. Uh, and if we're talking about adding uh, on top of that another two and a half billion, we already increased last year, the majority increased the, the, the amount of spending we're, do, spending we're doing for schools and libraries and, and, and doubled that 
budget, basically. So there, there's more spending going out the door, and I'm really concerned about, uh, concerned about how much we're taking from consumers and how that impacts their daily lives. So I share your concern, and I know you want to move on. And if we look at um, this is the, great, by the, the, the way, high cost. We can do this all if day. we look at uh, what we now call the Connect America Fund or the high cost program. You talk about an unequitable distribution in terms of, um, you know, and you've got the studies. The next panel will be one of the authors of the study that proves just that. Poor people are not getting their proportion of, um, you know, what they're paying in, what they're taxed for. Uh, that money is not flowing to those who need it the most. That money is, flow is flowing to Disney World and probably Aspen. I, I purposefully did not look up the Aspen numbers because I did not want to be really upset this morning. <laughs> but I know the money is flowing. And when I came into that airport and saw that flash that I could buy a home for $27 million, I don't think that person needs a subsidy, OK? I just don't. And so these are the things. So when we talk about, um, I look at this. Lifeline is but one of the programs, but I look at the entire, I'm looking at the entire universal service pie in terms of how do we look at it and ensure that the monies are flowing to where it's needed. And we need to make some hard, probably politically uh, unpopular decisions to, um, to do just that. And if we do just that, that equity in which you're speaking of, that lady on which you, you're speaking about, if she has a service, that money is not being um, appropriately spent, if you believe in the word fair, which I don't use that often anymore, but if you believe in fairness and equity, she's already being, um, honestly, um, not well treated. Well, and this is a very good point. I, I have, you know, worked on a number of issues in the past and in my previous life where we've done greater means testing. And so I think there's a, means testing would be very, very applicable in this space. And, and, and Lifeline is one that does, is, is, is the best example of, of some place where we do means testing. We do a little bit of it. It does somewhat in schools and libraries. Yes. Um, rural healthcare doesn't, it's because it's so small, it's, it's really not the same. But in high cost, we do fund consumers that are extremely wealthy. And I think that, that doesn't make as much sense. And, and I'm, I don't think we can get to a perfect equilibrium on exactly you know, what that number is, but we can certainly make sure if you make if you have a gross income above some number, 10 million, 100 million, whatever, that we don't subsidize you. I think that's a fair point. Uh, I think everyone would agree with that. We do. The, we, we we require Not consumers. Everyone. Well, we cons <laughs> we we pay. We require in America that consumers who have greater income pay more for the Medicare, uh, and we've increased that number. And Congress has bipartisanly uh, agreed to do so. Uh, just recently. So I think that's something that, that, that's needed. I don't know what that number is, and I'm not trying to pre pretend to know right at this moment, but there is certainly an artificial number that we can agree to that would you know, have some savings and realize that we're not subsidizing every American, no matter how wealthy you might be. OK, so, so I'm going to jump in here right, real quick, because yeah. sure. we're running out of time. Um, we're going to take audience questions, a couple in a sec. But before I do, um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, privacy. And yesterday, we heard a lot about um, you know, David Reddell was talking about how the FCC is preparing to uh, not only apply Section 222 of the Communications Act to internet providers, um, but also that it's you know, looking to tell ISPs you know, what they can and can't do with uh, quote unquote personal information, um, such as social security numbers um, and, and others. Um, so what, what other kind of personal information might potentially fall into this category? Um, what, what's, you know, what's your interpretation, Commissioner Riley, um, you know, of how the definition of CP&I could change in the future? Well, I, I would just say um, we are, I do believe the chairman has announced that he's going to do an item later this fall, uh, do it, start, a, start with an NPRM and, and get to final rules at some point. I'm troubled by that. I've talked about the difficulty in terms of what it means for different agencies that would oversee the same kind of information. But um, the difficulty I have is you know, 222 is fairly narrowly written. Um, it, it deals with telephone records. It is a very, you know, I, I know there's many people within the commission that would like to expand that, and we've seen that in a number of different items, whether it be consent decrees or NALs, they would like to expand what the definition is, but that's not something Congress has given to the agency. So if Congress would like to do that, that's certainly something they can affirmatively do, and we, we will certainly implement it to their, to their instructions. Um, I have difficulty with where we're trying to go on 222, what it means for different providers with the same type of information. We also are trying to reinterpret 201. Uh, and then what does it mean for throwing in 706? So, um, and I don't mean to throw in statutory provisions for people who aren't as familiar, but 
you know, it is an attempt to impose burdens on today. It is uh, about broadband providers. But I said yesterday, I, I fully believe that we're going to expand that scope into the edge, uh, edge provider side. There's already been petitions before us uh, to do so, and there'll be more going forward. And that's extremely problematic. Uh, I mean, as, as a consumer, I tend to think of, you know, if we're applying the CPNI framework to internet providers, my mind goes to, okay, all the traffic, you know, metadata that's associated with my web browsing history, my application usage, my IP address, is, is, the, is that sort of the level of granularity we're talking about here? Well, you know, for me, um, um, I didn't have a problem with the Terracom decision. Uh, you know, let me tell you, know, you know, affirm why. And, and we talked about this a lot. Um, we've got a, um, quite a few um, interactions and, and briefings. Um, you know, when, when I read, um, though not a lawyer, can't read, um, you know, 222A, it talked about, um, and to me it affirmed our duty to protect proprietary information. What's more proprietary than your social security number? I'm sorry. You know, you've got, you had um, individuals who entrusted a company, filled out applications, had their SSNs on there, and at the click of the mouse, I would have had access to that information. There's a problem with that. And I believe that um, the FCC um, had a duty, was aware of it, um, and had a duty uh, to act. I also believe that um, where there is either shared or gray areas by way of authorities, um, by, by way of authority with our sister agencies. Um, we have and will continue uh, to work collaboratively um, to ensure that nothing falls uh, beneath the cracks. Um, but I think we had a, 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 we, and I mean this in the collective family, we had uh, a, a duty uh, to respond and act um, and to affirm to that company and the others similarly situated that you will not, um, you know, be cash, you know, have a casual, um, uh, uh, you know, arrangement or lack of arrangement with somebody's personally, you know, personal, you know, identifiable um, information. And um, we acted uh, swift, it's, it's swift, swiftly in FCC time frame. <laughs> we acted uh, swiftly and, and, and put out, um, you know, a, a definite uh, uh, signal t to those uh, that this will not be tolerated. Well, I think that, that my, my, my colleagues' comments highlight some of the problem I've had. If you look at the statute, PII, which most people who work on privacy are familiar with, that's not in the statute. We are, we are, we are reinterpreting and creating definitions that don't exist in the law to serve a particular purpose. And I certainly support your point that you don't want anyone to fall through the cracks, but what that actually really means is we're going to have double agencies and double regulation for providers. That means people fighting amongst ourselves, and do I do this for the FTC and this for the FCC? What about the CFPB? How am I trying to navigate this universe with the same data, even though I've got so many regulators in front of me? So I have extreme problem uh, on that side, and I think we're, we're, we're heading in a collision course uh, later this fall. Respectfully, at the, at the time of this particular decision, I did not hear about any other agency um, um, that was poised to act on behalf of these consumers. Uh, a lot of them um, who are not that well healed and had no idea where to go uh, to get protected. So I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I think that um, the mechanisms, both casually and officially, um, are in place for us to not step on each other's toes. Um, but um, you know, having uh, to be able to go on a website and access somebody's um, social security number, that is, uh, is unacceptable. And I think we had to act. Let's take an audience question or two. Um, there's a roving mic going around. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Yeah, in the back. Uh, Peter Pitch with Intel. Uh, references made to the 17% levied on interstate telecom revenue. Should that include broadband? Do I start? No. Well, I have had deep concerns about expanding the, uh, the uh, collection side of the equation until we resolve many of the other spending sides. I mean, what, what it seems to be is we're going to spend as much as we possibly can, as much, you know, expand the programs as far as we possibly can, and then we'll do the collection side reform, which means we'll add broadband in there, because then it will look like the number is going down. We'll spread the base to even broader point. And I'm, you know, if the goal is just to spend as much as we can and then collect it on this side, no, I'm not, I'm not for that. And that seems to be where we're, we're attempting. If, you want to have a, if people want to have a thoughtful conversation about collection reform, I'm always for that. 
I, and, I, and I think the conversation needs to continue and to, and, and to tone down the rhetoric, rhetoric when we talk about contribution reforms. You know, I, I highlighted it earlier in terms of um, where uh, what has been happening um, over the years is whether it was explicitly said or not, um, our universal, so our funding has been going to support broadband. Um, and, uh, and so I, I really think it's time for us to have um, you know, an adult conversation about uh, what uh, the contributions, uh, you know, th those proportions look like, and, and just really um, uh, you know, be, you know, go, go to a place where it's as equitable as possible about you know, where the money is actually flowing um, and um, you know, how efficient and effective um, this current framework is, which quite honestly I don't believe um, is as, um, it's not efficient um, and it's not as effective as it should be. Well, I'm always ready for an adult conversation. I have difficulty because some of the adults have answered this question. If you go to the Congress and ask them, are you for imposing a fee on broadband internet access? The answer is no, right? We have internet tax free more, uh, uh, there was a moratorium now, but the Internet Tax Freedom Act to prevent state and localities from imposing this burden because the acknowledgement has made by the Congress that imposing this fee or some type of all the state and local uh, uh, taxes would increase the cost and therefore decrease adoption. So we would be doing the same thing that Congress, the, the, the people who give us authority, um, ha have said don't do. And I say that the monies are flowing. They are supporting the construction of broadband networks. And we need to have a, a conversation about that and what that means uh, when it, as it relates to contribution. All right, let's take another question. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alan Rawls, Sidley Austin. I've enjoyed the healthy debate on whether there is statutory authority for um, uh, uh, enforcing against uh, privacy for personal information that's not proprietary information and whether there was fair notice before the Terracom decision was handed down. But apart from that, my question is about the penalties and the vast discretion that the FCC has in terms of coming up with a number for your uh, notices of apparent liability. I think in the Terracom case, the commission started out saying that this could be a $10 billion uh, penalty, but in the uh, exercise of grace, uh, it was uh, remitted down to, I think, 10 million, and it may have ended up lower. But isn't there a, a, a fairness issue with regard to the range of discretion that the agency has to establish a, a notice of apparent liability amounts? So I'm not going to counter what you said. Um, I will um, affirm that you know, every case is different. Um, when you talk about your social security number, which you can't get an, a, a, another one, um, of, as far as I know, legally, um, uh, you know, t to me that's serious. Um, I, mean, I don't know what that troubles to, uh, but you know, you could talk about um, you know other um, uh, instances where, um, uh, in terms of, of some of the lifeline uh, uh, potential, uh, you know, decisions that. Um, those are very troubled if you talk to some of the providers based on um, what the uh, proposed, I mean, what the um, alleged infraction. So, um, you know, always I, I believe that um, there uh, needs to be, uh, you know, conversations and uh, uh, checks and balances as it relates to that. But every situation is different, and so it, it's kind of, uh, you know, difficult for me to say hard and fast. Um, I'm not going to disagree with you, um, but. Uh, uh, that will be something that we will continue to look at, uh, but uh, some discretion, I believe, is needed because, uh, again, every case is different, um, and the severity of, of that um, uh, may differ depending on who you're representing. So I couldn't, um, I, I'll take the opposite view. I agree with your point. I think the problem we have now, twofold, one is we're grasping for numbers just out of thin air. They're not based on anything at all, and I tried to force the Enforcement Bureau to give me justification for, for numbers, and they, 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 it's just not there. And, and they, they, the second part is, if it was you know, sound enforcement per, for, for purposes, and there's a number of reasons, and I've talked about this in a, a number of different settings, what enforcement is, is to do, um, the one that we seem focused on today in the Enforcement Bureau and the, the activities in the Enforcement Bureau is to get the biggest headline we possibly can. We want the headline to say, this is the largest fee for this purpose, the largest penalty for this purpose. That is not, in my 
my opinion, the purpose of enforcement. It is not to make someone happy that they have a good headline in whatever uh, trade publication or newspaper to make themselves feel better. This is about enforcement, which has a number of sound um, purposes in, in both the statute and our precedent. And we seem to be ignoring that. And so both parts are just, it's just amazing. There's, I gave a speech recently, not, not too long ago, that talked about, you know, the, 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 some of the, the folks uh, it, it, within the agency had gone to, to provide and said, we think the number you uh, were starting with is one billion. A billion dollars. What do you think, where do you think that money is coming from? They think that it's going to come from the pockets of the CEO or some of the, the rich uh, dividend uh, recipients. That is going to come from the bottom line of the company, and that means fewer jobs, fewer deployment, uh, less deployment. I mean, that's problematic just in of itself. And secondly, they don't have a justification for the number in the first place. So it becomes a charade, but they do get the headline, and that's, that seems to be important today. One Let's of the things to keep in mind is if you get an action or, or, or uh, um, if, if you get to that point, all is not right. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you get the attention of the Enforcement Bureau, all is not rosy. Uh, so let's you know, work from that baseline. We could talk about um, you know, the amount of treble damages. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to have that conversation. Um, but um, more often than not, um, when a decision is handed down, it's not because um, everybody was compliant. And so let, let's, keep that, let's have that baseline conversation and the rest of this, uh, I believe we can work through. All right, so let's take one more audience question and then, then I'm gonna close with a question of my own. Uh, yeah. Oh, Joy. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Lynn Stanton, Tara Daly. I wanted to follow up on your apparent agreement about means testing for. I'm high, sorry about. I'm sorry. I wanted to follow up on your apparent agreement on means testing mm. for uh, high cost subsidies. And I was wondering if either of you had any concrete vision of how that would work in reality, because other than turning it into a voucher program for individuals, I'm not being able to picture anything, and I'm just interested in what your thoughts were. Well, I, uh, and, and, and I'll start, and please. But I would start and say this. I'm, right now I am focused on trying to solve the issue that we're both tackling on, on, on rate of return, uh, standalone broadband. I do think that's something, and I, I, I've articulated just my initial thoughts on this, and I've, I've done you know, quite a bit of work in, my, like I said, my past life. So I think we can set a, a cap to, you know, you can have annual certification that you're not making 10 million, wouldn't pick a number. We can figure some of that out. It is very rough at this point, but I think there is a way to make sure. It's never going to get to the point where, you know, you get down to the exact number of who should get a, cert, a subsidy in the high cost program. But we can certainly exclude a number of people that definitely do not need it. That's my take. And, and one of the things that's troubling to me, so, so the answer is no, I haven't worked out, I, I don't have the a template, template to uh, present to you uh, this morning, but one of the things um, that I am mindful and that um, is, is in the works is we're going to include the allowables, what's allowable and what's not. Um, believe it or not, um, there was not, um, uh, we, we didn't have that menu you know, of um, you know, what's acceptable spending or not. So you had, and I bring this up, this is where my edge comes in. So you had certain companies um, that were, um, you know, with excessive, uh, CEOs with excessive salaries. You had people buying uh, meat, artwork, um, you know, extravagant uh, travel uh, and, and the like. You had those types of things going on. That needs to cease. You talk about, I, I don't know what fraud is, but I think I recognize waste and abuse when I see it, and that is it. No headlines. I didn't see the headlines coming from the media, but that, that's just a personal, um, <laughs> you know, a personal push from, from me. So these are the types of things that um, I think are steps towards that. Um, out, outside of that, uh, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, it's very difficult. It's a four billion dollar, um, you know, right now, um, you know, frame four plus billion dollar um, framework. A lot of uh, companies, and this is going to take. Um, this is going to be a con continual collaboration with our, our state counterparts because a lot of the abuses that um, I'm aware of came from state regulatory authorities who um, you know, who went inside of the books. They do that better than we do, by the way. So, um, went in, inside of the, the books and um, and, and do that. So I, I'm sorry to be ro robust. Ro so verbose, but we're working towards that. So we're out of time, and I want to be mindful of the next uh, the next session. Well, I'm on it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to close by asking one more question about privacy, which is, um, you know, should consumers uh, be expected to have uh, different 
expectations of what kind of privacy protections they're going to get when it comes to A, edge providers, hmm. and B, their internet providers? Hmm. I'll let you go first. Well, I would answer this. I think there, there is, an, uh, I've spent a great deal of time in privacy. Um, I think there is an expectation uh, of different treatment based on the information in and of itself, not on who is the provider uh, underling, whether it be the platform or the edge provider. They do have you know, more sensitivity to health records and health information. They have more sensitivity to financial information in some regards. And we have great, you know, we have a number of laws that, that, that cover that today. The difficulty with privacy is it's, it's a number of laws and a number of agencies and a number of, of, of governing structures that make it very difficult going forward. And we're going to add another one um, come this fall. So I answered this in, in I guess, in a, a broader sense, um, that um, each time we click on a mouse or, or access, we give up a little of ourselves. And I think that level of privacy and um, um, honestly gets chipped away each time um, we fill out a form and we share um, our personal information. So I think we need to have a, a healthy, realistic um, series of expectations when it comes um, to um, What's, and what's the definition of privacy anymore? I've seen the videos, it's very liberal. <laughs> and I don't mean party liberal. Um, but um, still, when you entrust your personal information to uh, you know, a company or an individual, there are uh, certain expectations you should have. Um, and um, I, I think that um, the, a regulatory backstop is the best, um, one of the best means um, you know, to help um, uh, you know, uh, send out and affirm that signal. Let me just add just one final comment that information sharing is what is making the current internet operating today. And if you saw the videos of what Google is able to do, you know, the amazing things people like from that, that's from information sharing um, that people are able and does happen today. Absolutely. Commissioner O'Reilly, Commissioner Clyburn, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this panel. Thank you.